local control funding formula, in-depth policy updates on the new school funding system, presented by Children Now. All right, thank you everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, this is Jelena Hausbrook with Children Now. I just wanted to go over a few logistical things. First, uh, you'll see on your screen that you can ask questions. We'll do a Q&A at the end, but feel free to ask questions throughout and we'll be collecting them so that we can go through them at the end. Um, we are recording this webinar and it will be available online and we'll send out emails to everyone who registered as soon as that's available. And I think that's all. If there are any logistical issues you have, there should be a go-to webinar number um, that you can call for technical support. So I am going to turn it over to Children Now's President, Ted Lempert. Well, uh, thank you, Julian, and good morning, everyone. Um, today's uh, goal on, on the next slide in the webinar is to provide transparency in the state policymaking process to uh, mostly grass tops organizations. Um, I think, as you're aware, there are some critical decisions that are going to be made by the State Board of Education in the next number of months. And we're going to focus on this webinar is on, on what the status is as of today, um, an analysis of, of where things uh, stand, and how you can have an impact on that state level uh, decision making process. Um, these state decisions are going to have a major impact um, on the decisions made uh, throughout the state and local school districts, um, but there's also a, a, a need uh, to have uh, strong advocacy and awareness in, in every single school district um, throughout the state um, if we're going to ensure that the promise of the local control funding formula. Um, so while there's a wide diversity of groups today on the phone, and, and we're uh, thrilled by that, um, most of, of you were what we would call a grass tops uh, groups. Um, and so some of this webinar will get, uh, they use the phrase, a little bit wonky in, in some of the discussion we're going to have about what's in front of the state. Uh, State Board of Education. Um, but there's also a need um, for a wide range of folks, students and parents and community groups throughout the state uh, to also have information about what's going on at the state level um, as well as uh, uh, communications and support for, for local advocacy. So just want to let folks know on the, on the phone, um, especially as we dive into some of the really specific details here, that in addition to continuing these state level uh, webinars. Um, we're also going to be uh, starting to provide communications uh, that go out to the field um, in, in very easy to understand language and, and translated that can be used by st uh, students and parents and community folks, um, also used by uh, school leaders uh, to not only keep folks up to date as what's going on at the state level, uh, but really to provide uh, support and, and suggested uh, talking points and tools for, for advocacy in, in school districts uh, throughout the state. Uh, the one other comment is I know some of you on the phone have a particular focus on early learning and development or, or school climate or, or, or arts education or other specific issues, um, and, and not on this webinar, but uh, going forward we will be providing some uh, specific talking points about uh, how the local control funding uh, formula can, can be uh, leveraged in support of, of those issues. Um, all that being said, um, there is plenty to keep us busy today talking about what's going on. Uh, at the state board level and uh, to provide an analysis of that and how you can get involved. So with uh, no further ado, I'm going to uh, turn it over uh, to our Senior Education Director, Samantha Tran, to, to walk you through the rest of the webinar. Thanks, Ted. Uh, so as Ted mentioned, we are today going to systematically walk through the draft regulations before the board. And it is important to know that these are drafts um, and we'll talk a little bit about the process here towards the end. Um, it's our hope that uh, there will be some specific takeaways as um, you know, folks walk away from the webinar and have learned some hopefully some helpful information. Um, one is uh, uh, having a greater appreciation for why accountability is so important as we're making this transition to LCFS and that we are very clear about and transparent about how we're approaching the work and how we're um, analyzing the current draft regulations. Um, in addition, we want to lay out um, some of the critical decisions that are, are before the board and identify some potential options um, as, we're, as we're further deliberating on this front. And finally, um, that we provide some tools to the field uh, for those folks who are interested in getting more involved at the state level. Why does California need strong accountability as we're moving towards um, developing the LCFF regulations? The regulations are, are critically important. Um, there is significant direction within the law on um, some of these elements that are before the board, um, which we'll review here in a moment. 
But the board has also been tasked with further defining in, in more kind of practical terms how this is going to play out. And that has a specific impact on um, educators at the local level as they're trying to figure out how to develop services and programs, how they're developing um, new plans and their budgets. And so it, it, it will shape that process. In addition, it also has an impact on how oversight bodies, both at the local and the state level, um, are monitoring what is and what isn't allowed. And so it, it, it sets up these systems um, in place. In addition, if done right, um, regulations can really provide access for the public to, to be able to be more engaged and so um, to participate locally in that process around developing programs and plans and budgets, um, to be able to track progress overall um, and for um, significant subgroups of populations of students, um, and really to help ensure accountability. So uh, for lots of reasons, these regulations are really important and I think that's why we've seen all of this stakeholder engagement um, by the board and um, a lot of involvement from, from leaders and groups up and down the state. More specifically, what, what does the LCFF legislation call for? What is the board tasked with doing? And essentially they have two major milestones. The first of which is to further define three cri critical elements within the law. Um, around how districts are going to demonstrate, um, and again, this is pulled right from, from the code section, increased or improved services for essentially high-need kids, for English learners, low-income students, and foster youth, in proportion to the amount of funding, um, essentially, that they're generating. Um, so th those are kind of two things that, in practical terms, the board needs to further define. The law also allows for the use of funding, so that these additional dollars, for school-wide, district-wide, and county-wide purposes. And that's really an acknowledgment of the fact that you know, research and practice has shown that systemic approaches are often the most effective in, in terms of um, uh, providing additional prevention and intervention services. Um, so it's a, it's a recognition to that, um, but it, it is an area where uh, clarity is needed. So, all of these, these different pieces need to be further defined, and, and that is what the, the board has been tasked with doing and has been engaged in over the last several months. In addition, there's a second major milestone that's important um, as, as we think about the, the final implementation pieces this year around LCFF, and that's the adoption of a template for the Local Control and Accountability Plan, or LCAP, as many of us have been referring to in shorthand. Um, the LCAP is really the cornerstone of the, the finance law because it lays out what a district, charter, county office's vision is for, for student outcomes and the services that they're going to provide. And for the first time, it, it creates a direct linkage between this, um, this plan and actual resources and the budget. So it's, it's, it's a very important element of the law. Um, and you'll notice that the, the, the law actually calls for the state board to adopt this template no later than March of next year, March 2015. That timeline will likely be expedited, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about um, some of the rationale behind that and where we are. So before we actually dive into the actual regulations and um, some of our um, analysis of the regulations as, as they stand right now in draft form, um, we want to provide um, some real transparency about how we're evaluating um, the, the current status and just be very clear about what the guiding principles are around this analysis. And these, these principles are, are directly linked to the larger campaign around LCFF and many of the things that brought stakeholders together around trying to get this, um, this law in place. The first is um, a, a strong focus on equity. Um, and so we ask ourselves as we're looking at the regulations, do they provide enough assurances uh, that high need students will receive additional supports and services? Secondly, and importantly, um, flexibility. Will local communities um, have the ability to innovate and, and be really responsive to student needs, to community needs, to be able to adapt, um, refine practice, and continuously improve? Um, so that's a, a core component. And then as it relates specifically to regulations, clarity is really important um, because we need to provide enough information so that all stakeholders, and this includes students and parents and um, the general public can understand what's expected and how to monitor actions. Um, and then lastly, accountability. Accountability is, is core and this is twofold from our perspective. One, can the regulations be used to ensure fiscal accountability and will the system ultimately be accountable around student outcomes? So um, these are the ways that we're uh, looking at the, the, the regulations and we'll be lifting these up throughout as we're having the conversation. Another important thing to um, 
set as context and, and um, a backdrop as, backdrop as we're talking about the um, regulations that are before the board is that the board has given some, some guidance to stakeholders and to staff around how they want these regulations to be developed. And so I think these are important um, goal, goal posts in order to keep in the forefront of our thinking, both in order to understand you know, what, what's before us and also for those who want to get more engaged um, so they understand the, the, the kind of where the board is coming at from uh, the perspective of, of the regulations. And so there are two main themes here. One is, <coughs> excuse me, one is that the board um, has directed the staff and stakeholders that they really want to provide multiple options to allow uh, districts, county offices, and charters the ability to, to demonstrate um, improved and, or increased services. And so they want to have a, a lot of different ways that, that folks can demonstrate this and not just have one single uh, regulatory approach. Secondly, they want to provide a comprehensive picture. And so this is one of the reasons why um, the template conversations around the local plan has been expedited. Um, the board wants to look at the, the um, language that's within the context of the template as they're also reviewing the regulation so that a full picture is available uh, to stakeholders and, and we can see how they interrelate. So the goal is to make them um, be very connected to one another. So given that as a, a their, the kind of the context, I, what we thought we would do is actually start with the LCAP template um, before we move into the actual fiscal regulations because there are some key components here. And um, there are some you know, concepts that are important in terms of the development of the template. First, the goal is at this moment to have, uh, you know, once the regulations are adopted, for districts and ch charters and county school, county offices of education to have a document that they can edit and that they can then post on their district websites. Um, over time, it's, it's envisioned that this will be a much um, more expansive um, approach where you'd have an online tool so that it wouldn't just be on a thousand school district websites, but that it would be more accessible, that the data would be pre-populated um, for ease of use. In addition, the way the framework is set up for the LCAP is it's organized into elements, and that's how we'll, we'll walk through it. We'll talk about the different elements. Embedded in each of those elements, there are um, questions that should be considered to help um, support the local analysis and, um, and, and the narrative that's, that's developed around this process. Um, finally, there, there's the intent to have um, a companion piece with the LCAP template that's uh, separate kind of non-biting guidance where we'd have a lot more um, questions that would provoke thinking and analysis at the local level, um, you know, support folks as they're trying to um, have a very broad view um, and communicate with the public. And so um, that will be on a similar track but separate from the actual template itself. The board has also laid out um, four principles uh, for how they want to approach this. First, um, they want to make sure that it's simple, that it um, is accessible to the public, that it avoids duplication with a lot of other plans that, that are currently required at the local level. The second, that it's um, transparent and that you're identifying how funding links to um, efforts to improve student outcomes. The third is that it's, it's very locally oriented and so that there is um, um, information that's relevant to the local circumstances. And finally, that it's uh, performance focused. And so there's a strong emphasis on um, student outcomes um, instead of compliance oriented requests. So they, these are some of the guiding principles that the board is looking at as they're working with staff and stakeholders to develop the template. So here are the different elements that are, are currently proposed in the LCAP template. Um, it's important to note that at this point, you know, we have a draft that's before us that's within the, um, the board agenda item and we'll provide a link at the end of the webinar so that folks can go directly to it and look at, look at the, the template. Um, it, this is an early draft and right now the um, law itself, the LCSF law itself, delineates probably more specific information um, than the current template. So for example, you know, there are eight state priority areas that are delineated within the law. There's lots of um, conversation about different data elements um, that are important to review. Um, there's multiple subgroups that are um, intended to be focused on in addition to those generating the additional dollars, so around like ethnic subgroups and the like. And so the law has a lot more information than the current template. Um, it's not clear if that's going to be con continue to kind of be the, the, the framework moving forward or if there's going to be a lot more um, embedded into the LCAP based on stakeholder feedback and direction from the board. So let's look at the first element. Um, 
you'll note that we pulled much of the language uh, from um, for the, these next couple of slides verbatim from the dra draft template so that folks can begin seeing some of the language that's evolving. Um, this, this section, which is around stakeholder engagement, really focuses on the critical role that stakeholders play in the process and puts added emphasis on focusing the conversation around student outcomes. Um, and you'll also note that the instruction and guiding questions similarly um, requires and asks districts to produce locally defined evidence uh, for how they've engaged stakeholders and what the result has been um, from that process. Um, as we mentioned earlier, there's going to be this, this non-binding binding guidance that um, is likely to be provided um, um, in tandem with the, the template. And the agenda item actually has some initial questions. So again, um, it's worth taking a look at to see the direction that the template is moving. Next on the template is a, a, needs, a needs analysis. And um, again, we'll point out that at this point, the, the language is at a very high level. Um, and there's a lot of latitude, it seems, in terms of what data is to be reviewed, how it's to be assessed, and how it's supposed to be acted upon. Um, so the, the kind of the next step in the process is as you're engaging your community, you're assessing your data and where students are at and, and where you're fitting along the, the different eight priorities and any local priorities that you've identified. After you've gone through that needs assessment, um, there, there's a section around goals. And um, local districts and um, charter schools and county offices, um, hopefully in concert with their community, are going to be required to develop some specific goals around student outcomes. Um, currently, the template calls for discussion about how those goals are related to all students, um, to differentiated by subgroups, uh, linked to the local and state priorities, and in the, any individual school sites as appropriate. Um, the language doesn't have a specific state guidance on how many goals or the rigor of those goals. Um, so that, that's uh, kind of where the, the template's at at this point. Once the goals are identified at the, at the local level, um, districts will be developing um, their performance metrics uh, about what they expect to see in terms of success over the next three years, broken down by year. So for this you know, upcoming school year and the two preceding school years, uh, for all students and um, for, for various subgroups of students. And again, the, the, the metrics, um, there's no statewide standards in terms of the rigor of those metrics, um, but this is uh, kind of the current iteration of, of the template. So finally, on the last two elements, there's a focus on both services and um, the budget. And this is where the, the, the district, county office, and charter school will list out um, the strategies that they're going to be using to meet the goals and the, the form, performance expectations that they have. It's also really important to lift up in this section, and this relates directly to the, the fiscal regulations, um, that, that in the context of this element, um, districts, again, charter schools, county offices, are going to have to delineate what program of support they're providing for all students, so across the board, every student within, within that jurisdiction, um, and what um, related expenses are linked to that core program, essentially, for all, for all students. And then um, they're going to have to delineate specifically what are the additional improved services or programs that are going to be provided with funding um, for low-income students, for English learners, and foster youth. So there's a step-by-step -step process um, for, for those subgroups. And then finally, as I mentioned, um, there's a budget uh, section where um, financial data will be displayed. And um, at this point, there are no standard templates, but some, some suggestions about different ways that the, that budget information can be displayed. So uh, with a quick overview of the LCAP template, um, we're going to now move over um, and walk through the, the fiscal regulations. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Deborah Brown. Thank you, Samantha. Yeah, so looking through, as we talked about it in the um, uh, last webinar, if we could advance the slide, please. We, we, um, the, um, uh, the, the board had laid out the potential um, of, of three options for demonstrating this increased or improved service. And so th they looked at it in terms of uh, three different ways. And so it's spend more, so that's purely um, fiscal, and so that's um, demonstrating um, an increase of funding spent on 
high need students, so those are foster youth English learners and low income students, uh, provide more. So that's, uh, you would demonstrate that um, increased or improved service through um, added or imp improved services for those students. Or then there's the achieve more option, which is demonstrated through um, growth on the state priorities for those students. And so the, the way that it's laid out in the you know, current um, proposed draft regulations is that uh, districts and counties and charters would uh, pick one, and they would it, and that would be used for developing their services plans for budget. And then it would be part of, um, it, it, and then they would show evidence of meeting that in their LCAPs, and so that's how that's how it would be demonstrated, and then would be reviewed and analyzed as part of those um, local budget and LCAP reviews and approvals, and then the annual audit. <clears throat> and so then the next few slides really look at those in a little bit more detail, and and what we see those mean. And so the the, the first option is is the spend more. So this is the again the purely fiscal one, and so this is. D districts uh, would demonstrate that they spent more on services for unduplicated students in, the, in proportion to the increase in the supplemental and concentration funding that they received. And so this would look at year-to-year -year increases in LCF funding and apply that to what uh, the amount of money that districts spent in the prior year. So what it would mean in, in 2000. Um, 14, 15. So the first year that we would be doing this would be looking at the prior year, which is 2013-14, uh, spending at least that amount and then having that increase that's proportional. So all of that would be um, would be done based on um, the the annual increases that would be provided. And so what that means is th is that all of those. Um, uh, the, those services would be defined locally, and so this would determine the amount of funding to invest because it, it would be met based off um, that, that starting point. And the rate of increase would be different for um, districts as well. Um, and then the, the funding levels are intended to reach the full LCFF target, so at the full implementation, um, that, that gap between what's currently being provided for high need students would be, would be closed. Um, and so, then, as, as Samantha had, had talked about before, when, when we're looking at these proposals, we're, we're analyzing them based on what, what we see as our priorities and objectives for um, the, the LCFF. And so, it, it's through that lens by which we are looking at these options. And so, on the spend more option, we look at this from the question of equity and does it and, and does it meet that goal that 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 we view it of. And so, there is. So the idea of providing transparency on the investment of funding for high need students, and is that um, demonstrable? Uh, it certainly does provide flexibility on how the investment of funding is approached, and then that gradual increase is, is, is also um, flexible for districts. Um, there is one area where, it, where there does need to be additional clarity, and, and we'll go into this a little bit more in the next section of the webinar where we do talk about the decision points, but but the idea that there is no definition for school-wide services or district-wide services, and the idea that um, uh, how much of the supplemental and concentration dollars can be spent for school-wide and district-wide services, and, and how broadly that is defined. Um, and, and then that, that fourth uh, priority or goal, which is accountability, and, and it's difficult to measure the accountability without defining the school-wide and district-wide, and so Without having answered the fir that first question, it's difficult to assess the accountability on, on, on this option. Now, the, the second option is the provide more, and so this is demonstrated by adding or improving services for high need students. And so, the, um, the the draft regulations do provide examples of what this what this could mean. And again, these are just examples and, and not intended to be um, the exhaustive list. And so, there are different ways to do that. And so, that's looking at extended learning time. Um, adding um, before and after school programs, expanding existing before and after school programs, um, increasing um, specialized programs or staff to uh, support, provide support for those programs. Could also be uh, demonstrated through professional development. And so if, if there was a level of, of professional development to be provided that was um, targeted at helping um, teachers and staff support high need students, um, that would be a way to, to use those dollars um, and meet this provide more option. Um, it could also be done through supplemental learning materials. Again, it's clear that that's, this is intended to be um, examples and not the list. And so the result 
of that is looking at the services would be defined again locally and the level of funding would not be required by the state and so it would just be that demonstration of, of locally defined services and the rate of increase would again be different for every district based on how they wanted to, pr to provide more and the level of services would, would also be defined locally. And, and to look in analyzing that, it, it meets much of the same, um, looking at those goals on the next slide, it, it does uh, look very similar to the, um, the analysis on the um, spend more option. It, uh, could we advance the slide? Thank you. And so the, so this, um, uh, again, the, the equity, because it, it's unclear given that there's no specific level of service or funding um, would be required and that it is locally, all locally determined. Um, the transparency of increased services uh, would be linked to the LCAP. Um, the flexibility on the services would be um, uh, completely, it, it, it is completely flexible, so that would be locally determined. Um, and then the, the, the clarity and the accountability, again, are, are similar to the concerns in the spend more option with this uh, lack of definition on school-wide or, or district-wide, it's, it's difficult to assess the accountability. On that and then so then looking through this uh, third option which is the achieve more and so um, um, it, it's looking at, at, at the outcomes on the on the eight, eight state priorities and so um, do LEAs demonstrate an increase in achievement by providing evidence of achievement and so this would be for a two or, two or more year period excuse me for high need students on on the state priorities and and, and that um, that achievement would be based on uh, um, e either state or local data. It's it's um, and would be through the LCAP. So the measures for so the result is what is measured for student outcomes would be defined locally, and that would be defined through the LCAP. The goals would also be defined locally and spelled out through the LCAP. And success. Um, how is success defined? Um, it is defined as significant growth on or improved student outcomes over time, um, and that time frame would be defined locally. And so the an analysis of that, looking at those um, those goals, would be um, that uh, it, it's not clear on the equity part because it's not based on funding or service levels, but on outcomes. So, so it, it, it doesn't meet that equity principle. Um, it certainly does provide flexibility. Um, there does need to be additional clarity on what does what is meant by su uh, sufficient growth, and how many measures would we determine um, that that growth is based on, and then would there be a state role in setting these expectations? So would the um, the the growth be measured on local um, uh, local uh, criteria, and then goals based on local criteria as well, and then the um, it. it Concerned about the accountability on this piece is can it be demonstrated? Uh, if everything is locally determined, what what level does um, a state um, the the measurement of the state priorities? Because uh, in light of the evaluation rubric not being in place for another um, uh, two years, and so being able to really look at that and see that without the evaluation rubric, which all LCAPs will be measured by, um, questions the accountability piece of that. And so with that, I will turn it back to um, Samantha to talk over the um, options and the decision points that are uh, that the, the State Board is looking at next week. Thanks, Deborah. So uh, with that, the, a quick overview again of the regulations and, and kind of a um, high-level analysis of, of uh, what's before us, we'd like to lift up some of the key decision points or options uh, that are likely to continue to play into the conversation around the development of the regs. Um, so first, as we mentioned earlier, we've been uh, focused on this issue around um, the definition of a school-wide purpose or use of the funds. Um, the, as the regs are currently written, um, because they're not defined, they, they provide a lot of latitude at the local level um, for locals to um, identify their own interpretation or potentially for the state to come back in and make further refinements. Um, so again, if adopted today, the regs would provide this kind of continuum of approaches. And this is including, but not necessarily limited to. We're just providing some, some examples. Um, so one, on one end of the spectrum, a district um, 
could, or charter school or county office, could choose no, no, no restrictions and essentially use the supplemental concentration funding for, um, at any school uh, for any purpose. And so there, that's one end of the continuum. Um, there are other ways that, that um, locals and or the state could uh, create some additional um, definitions. So for example, defining where um, school-wide can be applied uh, based on um, the school's makeup. And so essentially looking at, for example, student demographics. We see this at the federal level um, where there has to be a concentration of a, of a number of um, high-need students before the, the funding can be used for any purpose or for any specified purpose. So that's another way you could create some tighter definitions around this. Uh, the third um, option is defining what um, types of supports and services um, um, the, the additional supplemental concentration funding could be used for. So, for example, as we mentioned earlier in the LCAP, there is this requirement that um, it, within the plan uh, we identify what all kids have access to, so that core program uh, of support um, for students. And uh, one way to approach this would be to suggest and, and provide parameters that when you're using supplemental concentration funding for um, at a school-wide level, that's in augmentation to the core. So that it, you're demonstrating that it's for additional supports and services, um, specifically for those po subpopulations. And or you, you could frame it similar, again, to how uh, the federal um, Title I approaches it around student need. So again, uh, or student achievement, so uh, providing additional supports and services for, for low achieving students. So in addition to, to school-wide, another key area of definition is um, this district-wide or county-wide um, approach um, uh, to providing services. And again, this, the, this was included in the law because there was a strong recognition that the research shows that you know, often systemic approaches are the most effective. So allowing districts um, to, to really create an intervention model or to provide mentoring teachers or, you know, different approaches that, that really um, allow the, the districts to, to support systems um, was, was important. Um, the way that, again, the regulations are currently written, there's a, a broad latitude in how this could be interpreted locally and or that the state could come in and, and create some, some tighter definitions. So at one end of the spectrum, Again, um, a, a local community could interpret it as no restrictions, essentially using the supplemental con concentration dollars uh, for any and all purposes um, throughout, throughout the jurisdiction. Um, again, there are ways that you could define it more. So for example, you could define when this is allowable, um, the use of, of funding um, based on, for example, again, the student demographics of the district. So if a, if a district has a large proportion of high need students, you know, you could set a percentage and then say that the fund could be used for any purpose or for specific purposes. That's one approach. Um, another approach uh, could be to define how much of the supplemental concentration dollars could be used for this purpose. So, you know, you could say that 10%, 20%, 30%, you know, that the, 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 you could look at a, a range um, of, of the funding can be used um, for any purpose or for specific purposes. And then finally, this issue of defining those specific purposes. And again, the research demonstrates that where you have the highest yield impact, it's district initiatives that provide additional prevention services for high-need kids um, and or intervention services, uh, especially around low-performing students and schools. And so you know, those are, again, some of the options. It's not an exhaustive list, but it, it provides you a sense of um, the, the different parameters that, that could be at play. So in addition to the school-wide and district-wide um, definitions, uh, we also thought it was important to lift up a critical, qu critical question that's um, before the board. Um, and it's really identifying what's the state's role in measuring, defining, and tracking student outcomes uh, for outcome accountability purposes. Um, and so we, we pose the question um, in this slide and the next slide. So the first question is, does the state have a role in measuring progress? And if so, there are some contextual things that are important to note. Um, first, because LTF is so new and we're moving in this direction, a lot of the eight state priority areas don't actually have standard measures yet. And certainly, there, there's not a lot of um, sharing of that information to the state because, again, we're, we're just starting down this road. Um, in addition, our state assessment system is in transition. As we, we're moving to Common Core, um, we made a policy decision to 
um, put our assessment system on hold, and so we're field testing the new Smarter Balance assessment around English language arts and mathematics. Uh, social science assessments have been disbanded, and um, the science assessments, um, which aren't aligned to our new standards, which is the Next Generation Science Standards, are um, you know, just for federal requirements and not some of the other assessments that we've historically had. So we're in this time of transition around some of the core data elements, which is around kids' outcomes, what they know and are able to do. Um, and so it creates some constraints about how the state has the ability to measure uh, student outcomes at the moment. Um, in addition, we pose the question, does the state have a role in setting goals, uh, what, are, what rigorous goals there are for student outcomes, and then what are, what's reasonable progress to those goals? Um, as we mentioned earlier in the LCAP and in the Achieve More option, um, the way it's currently constructed, every, all of these pieces would be defined locally. And so um, the question is posed, does the state have some role in that? And if so, again, we have these context considerations that, that we're in the midst of right now because we have uh, transitioned our assessment system. Our accountability system is very much linked to that, our outcome accountability system, the academic performance index that California has, um, and our academic yearly progress for the federal level is all in flux. Plus, there are some state policy measures that have called into question some, some modifications to our academic performance index, especially at the high school level. And so th this piece is very much, again, in transition. Um, similarly, the LCFS law calls for um, a body to be created, the California Collaborative on Educational Excellence, that will provide technical assistance, you know, support to districts, and intervene um, if there is not significant progress. Um, but that body has yet to be formed. We're, again, still in, in very much in transition mode, and so that, that is not yet available. And as Deborah mentioned earlier, the evaluation rubrics um, for these different plans um, is not slated to be adopted until October 2015. Now, again, the board could certainly expedite that, um, but we've not begun those conversations in substantive ways around what, what the evaluation rubric would look like. So there are just a lot of these different contextual pieces um, that are, are you know, making um, the options around this front um, challenging if there is a state role, um, and um, children, I would certainly say that, that there is a role in, in holding us, you know, us accountable for what we want kids to achieve and to ensure that they're college and career ready. And, you know, ready to participate in our economy and our society. So um, we, we put these out there as a framework for, you know, some of the deliberations. Again, you know, constantly wanting to reinforce that these are drafts. Um, we're in the process, and there's a lot of room for um, stakeholder engagement. So what I'd like to quickly do, because I know uh, we want to leave some time for Q&A, is just talk through the timeline and um, how folks can get engaged. So next week, uh, we have a very critical meeting with the State Board of Education. They're having a hearing on this issue on Thursday um, at starting at 8 a.m. And um, this meeting is really critical because it is the only meeting before the board has to adopt at least the fiscal regs in January. And so this is the opportunity for you know staff uh, to lay out the the, the current um, the current draft for stakeholders to really engage and and share their point of view and ultimately for the board to provide provide direction so that we know what the next steps are. Um, and what the regs are going to look like when they come back to the board in January. Um, so again, this timing is really important, and um, they'll be meeting next week. So there are two ways that folks can, I think, essentially get engaged in the process in, in more formal ways. One is um, writing, you know, engaging in letter writing. And um, just a few tips, just from from those of us who've been around the state board for a long time, um, just to, as you're as you're thinking about writing letters, um, some things to think about. One, it's really important to you know, let the board know who you are and who you represent, whether that's an organization or a larger constituency. Um, second, really focus on trying to keep the letter you know, to one page, two pages at the most, so that it can be digestible and that you're focusing on the specific information that you really want to convey, um, because you know, it is likely that the board will be getting lots of feedback. Um, letters from individuals, from organizations, from coalitions of organizations are all effective strategies. Um, and have impact. Um, so that those are important ways to approach it. And in terms of logistical information, and we will be providing um, this PowerPoint, um, as Jelena mentioned, soon, and the audio file uh, up as fast as we can, so that uh, hopefully you're not scurrying and writing this down right now. But the, the main timelines are, um, if you can get letters into the State Board by Friday, um, this November 1st, by no later than noon, 
and those letters will be um, included in the board packet as background information. Um, there's some information here about how you can submit by email, by fax, um, by snail mail. Um, it's important to put on that letter that you're referencing agenda item number 13. And again, we'll have a link to, to that item um, if, if, if you decide to write a letter. Um, you can also bring your letter with you if you're going to testify on, on Thursday. Um, if you do that, um, you can pass it out to the board. I suggest bringing at least 20 copies uh, for board members and staff. So the day of, um, again, they are going to be holding a public forum, uh, an official hearing on this issue. Um, and so again, a few tips um, from those of us who, who sit through those board meetings. Um, it's really important that you focus on specific recommendations to the board. The board is at this point um, focused on the language that's before them. And so if there are specific things you'd like to see remain, specific things you'd like to see removed, or new language that you'd like them to consider, that's um, a, a really effective way to um, engage um, the process uh, because you know, they've, they've been getting feedback for the last six months or so at a higher level and now it's getting very specific. So um, focusing on specifics is helpful. Um, there are likely to be numbers of people who are participating in the hearing um, next Thursday. And so um, one effective strategy is if there are a number of people who've gone before you that have made a point that you think is essential, you can um, quickly reiterate that point and not necessarily um, speak longer unless there's something else you want to add to make the case because, um, again, it, it, it just to build off um, uh, previous speakers is, is often helpful. Um, another approach, if folks want to come up and participate but don't necessarily want to speak or if you want to demonstrate you know, the, the, the number of stakeholders that um, you're partnering with, an effective strategy is to elect a spokesperson or two and have the group come before the podium and you know, not everyone has to speak but you can, you can be represented through that individual. So again, some logistical information for the day. Uh, the hearing will be starting at 8 o'clock on the 7th. It will be at the California Department of Education. Um, which is here in Sacramento. Um, if you are organizing a large group, the State Board staff is asked that you contact them in advance. Uh, they, they are, um, uh, the room is, it, it holds a healthy size, but there are regular um, stakeholders who participate. And so um, if there's going to be a lot of people um, coming up, it'd be helpful to figure out the logistics and make sure that everyone's comfortable during the, the public hearing process. Given that there, we're expecting volumes of folks coming up to speak, uh, public testimony will likely be limited to two minutes, and there is the potential that it could be limited to even more, to just one minute per speaker. So again, reinforcing, it's just really important that you've rehearsed in advance what you want to say and that um, you can deliver that tightly in the amount of time that's um, available. So with that, I think we'll open it up to questions and go from there. Um, Ted? Yeah, great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Sam and Deborah. Um, so the f we have a number of questions. We'll try to get through all of them. So the first question, um, Deborah, why don't you take this one? What type of data will be pre-populated in the LCAP uh, template? That's the the lo local plan template. Uh, right. So right now it's it's not clear. So the the intent is is for that to be developed over time, not and probably not available with with the first template. Um, so just to be clear that a, that a pre-populated template is not likely to be available now. That that's a, um, hopefully just a medium term goal, and that it will be something that will um, certainly start with having it be pre-populated. Uh, when that is available with all the information that um, districts already submit to the um, Department of Education and that they will need for their LCAP. But the, the longer term goal, I think, would be to have um, uh, pre-populated data for all of the elements and, and all of those state priorities. So it, it, it's more of a long term goal that, that hopefully we will see progress that starts with at least the information that districts are reporting now and, and hopefully expand to um, a healthy level of data that addresses all of those state priorities. Great. And then, Deborah, the question just came in on that point, so maybe you can handle that one, too. Which agency is responsible for creating the LCAP template? Well, so the, um, that would be the, um, the Department of Education will, will um, uh, create that template based on the regulations that will be approved in January. Okay, great. Um, so then the next question, Deborah, you can take this one, too. Is the single 
plan for student achievement still required? Yes, it is still required. Um, so, so there are uh, no changes to other other plans. Certainly, other plans that are federally required. the The hope is that they're not um, uh, duplicative efforts, but that they are um, uh, that they can work together and get and sort of gets at that goal that that was mentioned earlier about simplicity. But, but there are no changes to the requirement for that plan. Great. Um, the next question, and, and Sam, why don't you field this one? Um, the, the local control funding formula doesn't mention uh, disabled students, i.e., those with uh, IEPs. Does all students also include disabled students? Yes. Yeah, so the the law itself, um, the, within the context of the the statute, does require some disaggregation by different subgroups, which would include special education students. Um, so I think for both purposes of all students, you, you absolutely want to include special education students. And um, I think there is some, some guidance that, that pulling out some specific um, information around goals and performance for um, special education students is important. Um, the, as, as we mentioned, as we were looking at the LCAP, uh, right now it's currently focused on those students that are generating the additional supplemental concentration dollars. Um, but, but special ed is, a, is an essential subpopulation, and they receive, um, obviously, separate federal and state funding as well as local uh, general fund funding. Great. Um, and then if you could take this one too, Sam. Um, if a district gets no supplemental or concentration dollars, will that district still be required to budget, document, evaluate services uh, for those students? Yeah, every district, county office, and charter school in the state will be required to develop an LCAP. Um, because they are all receiving state funds. Great. Um, here's the next question, and, and uh, whichever one of you wants to take this one. What accommodations exist for year-to-year -year funding variation? So how will districts be held accountable uh, the next time state funding to district falls precipitously, as it certainly did in 2009, 2010, 2011? Right, and you know, this has actually been part of the stakeholder process, you know, the, this issue of you know, how do we think about this in a year of decline? And I don't think we have a, um, you know, a specific answer yet. I think we know that you know, these, these draft regulations are our first attempt to get um, some guidance out into the field, um, knowing that in the next couple of years we're likely to grow, given that um, the economy is um, moving strongly and, and Prop 30, 30 provides some, um, you know, ability to fill some budget gaps at, at this moment in time. But I do think it's a, an important question and one that we have been um, collectively wrestling with and that the board um, um, may want to address uh, sooner rather than later. Um, I will say that I do think that the volatility around resources is not significantly different than um, what we historically have, have faced in, in public education where, you know, we're, we're looking to see how much Prop 98 and the state budget is growing and what proportion of that then ends up um, going down to the local level. What is different under LCFF is that we have a target that we're moving to over time. And so while we may not know what the specific allocation is, um, you know, until the, the normal point in the process when we, when, you know, in January when that's initially released and then in May when it's revised, um, we have a sense for the trajectory that we're moving um, in, a, in the state. And so we can think about long-term multi-year budgets and our vision around, um, you know, those, that longer term and then start thinking about what are strategic investments uh, to move to that, that long-term vision, um, which hopefully is a different dynamic than we've um, had in the past where essentially, you know, you, you got some revenue limit and a few more gift cards under categoricals and it was very difficult to plan. Um, at least now you have a, hopefully, a, a North Star that you're shooting for and thinking about how those strategic investments um, can build on one another year after year. Although I would add, though, that because we are based on, on a target and, and it is getting over there over time and it is based on, on the Prop 98 growth, if there's little growth um, in, in Prop 98, then we'll only be closing that, that gap by a little, a little bit. And so the increase in funding is all proportional. To, uh, the, the increase in, in services or support or however you're going to meet that objective is all proportional to the increase in, in Prop 98. So hopefully we, we don't see where we, we actually make cuts. But, it, but if we do have a year where there is less growth, the, the formula adjusts for that and these regs seem to adjust for that as well by always referring back to the, to the increase. Um, so so, so the, there's a, allowing for some automatic adjustments in there. 
Great. Um, so let's see if we can get to some of these uh, pretty quick here because we're getting a lot of great questions. Um, next, will the, will the chronic absentee rate be determined by the, the definition of a chronic absentee as a pupil who misses 10% of the days enrolled? So essentially the question is asking are there proposals on how to define the absence rate? Yeah, at this point we've not seen specific definitions on that, that front um, within the context of the regulations. I, I do know, you know, obviously Children Now is very involved in this process too around um, some of the work to, to really focus the light on chronic absenteeism and especially when, when children miss more than 10% of the school year, the, the corresponding impact on their achievement and outcomes and how detrimental that can be. Um, uh, so I, I know that there's a kind of a, 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 a is it a rule of thumb that, that lots of folks are thinking about, um, but in terms of specific regulations and definitions, um, that has not um, been part of uh, what is before the board uh, to date. Okay. Um, a quick one. Are state board meetings broadcast or recorded? Yes, and we will get that to that with the next slide. I will give you some links. Perfect. Okay. Um, any insights on the interaction between the LCAP and the Sorry, the school accountability record card that's currently required. There's been a lot of conversation about, you know, how we leverage some of the data in the SARC. You know, per Deborah's point earlier, um, that districts currently do have to report um, a, a number of different data points up to the state, and the, those data points are often, you know, used in the SARC. Um, and similarly, um, that you know they could be used in the LCAP as pre-populated. In addition, there's a lot of local data in those SARCs, which again can be used for um, that analysis and the development of, of the, um, the LCAP. The law also says um, within the context of LCFS that there has to be, um, uh, I, can't, I can't remember the exact language, but something like, um, you know, that basically the data has to match between the, the SARC and the LCAP or that it has to be aligned. We can go back and look at the specific um, version of the, the, the law, um, but there, there is some, um, there's definitely a nod to the SARC in that context. Um, next question um, it revolves the eight priority areas and it, 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 the question is, is, are they incorporated into LCAP template or does it have to wait for the evaluation? Well, so the, the, the LCAP template and the regs, again, are modifying existing law uh, or providing more practical implication of the existing law. So the existing law is very clear about what the eight state priority areas are, that local priority areas can be identified and that there are these different sub-indicators that need to be reviewed and subgroups that need to be looked at and that it has to be connected to individual school sites. So all of that is within the context of the law. The templates as it's currently laid out um, it has a very uh, much higher macro level um, and, and doesn't provide all of that detail. Um, so moving forward, you know, seeing how those pieces come together will be important and I, I do know that um, the board and staff um, are, are, seem to be very open to um, feedback on that front about how you develop these documents and um, also adhere to the, obviously, the principles that they've laid out about it being simple. And um, so there are lots of, um, lots of different ways that the LCAP is I I important to the field and balancing all those goals will be important. Um, but again, uh, a lot of this is within the context of the law, too. Great. Um, so now I'm going to um, read three questions that I'll have some similarities and I'll make a quick comment and then and each of you can comment and that might take us to um, some of the closing things we need to go over. So here's the three questions. One, what if any on the ground strategies are being explored to ensure stakeholder engagement is representative and meaningful? Will these be decided exclusively at the district level or will the state weigh in? The next. Are there specific guidelines for how districts should engage with stakeholders, i.e. parents? And finally, does the parent involvement portion include budget input for the base grant or just budget input for supplemental concentration grants? So I'm going to uh, turn that over to Deborah and Sam to give some comments on that, but just say that uh, in, in terms of on-the-ground strategies to ensure stakeholder uh, engagement, there are, as, as Deborah and Sam are going to reference some, some state requirements there, but to, to really make uh, this, this law work, um, it, it, it's going to be really critical for uh, it to go way beyond what's required and for a range of stakeholders and students and, and parents in, in every district do engage in the local um, planning process. And so in, in particular areas, there's been a, a lot of effort to um, make sure that information and support is, is getting out there. and. Uh, and, and several foundations, including the, the California Endowment, and then certainly a lot of uh, groups, including ours, are going to be uh, distributing a lot of information to really try to get 
meaningful information and communications out to the to the range of folks that do need to be involved at the local level. Um, so with that, Deborah, Sam, um, you want to address the, those questions, especially as it relates to the, the guidelines and the, the state's role in terms of, of parental engagement. Yeah, I, I do. I, as you mentioned, Ted, there, there are some minimum requirements in the law, and, and obviously we've been talking with, with many of the different stakeholders about you know, how they are. They're, they're just baseline requirements and that there's going to be the need for a lot more um, authentic engagement at the local level. Um, so just really quickly, and some of our previous web webinars lifted this up, but I will um, quickly just kind of rattle them off. One, um, the district has to have a parent advisory committee um, to review the LCAP template and provide feedback. Um, and um, the, uh, secondly, if there is at least 15% or more English learners um, and 50 more or more students, um, there has to be an English language learner committee that similarly has the ability to provide uh, input. Um, in addition, the board and superintendent have to um, share with the field that the template is available or the plan is available for review and um, provide written comment on um, the feedback received from stakeholders. Again, the, the, the plan has to be reviewed at a public hearing, um, and then that hearing has to be separate from when the plan and the budget are adopted simultaneously. Um, so there are multiple kind of procedural ways in which um, communities can get involved. But I know in talking with district leaders up and down the state, the different state associations, um, and all of our different partners, community-based partners, equity partners, business partners, there's a lot of work happening right now to figure out, you know, what are, what are ways that we can really support the field? What are, what are innovative strategies that we're learning from each other about um, how to set the table and make sure that the information is available so that everyone can um, engage in the decision making and, and it be a value um, that they feel like they're being valued in that process and have the information in that process. Um, in addition to the point about base versus supplemental and where people get to weigh in, these plans are, are for the entire district, for the entire county and the entire county office um, and charter school. You know, this is their, their envision for how they're going to support student outcomes broadly. And so the plans um, have a lift up and provide some specific focus on these high need subgroups, but it is a plan for the entire budget. So um, I think our expectation and, and just by looking at the law is very clear that, that your folks are weighing in on the entirety of the plan. Great. And uh, while you have the floor, Sam, since we just have about a minute left, did you want to just quickly go over some next steps? Yes, absolutely. Um, so on, on this slide, we, we wanted to share a couple of very long email or uh, URLs, but again, we'll, we'll share this PowerPoint out to everyone who's registered um, to the, for the webinar. Um, the first is, as we mentioned earlier and as we've been mentioning all along around uh, these webinars, um, there's been a lot of stakeholder work at the state level to, to begin thinking about how you would translate what's in the law into regulatory form and, and, and to ensure that they're in a practical place so that, that folks can implement them locally and that there can be oversight. Um, so we provided an a email to one of the earlier iterations so you could again see um, some of the different options. And in this context, there's actually two fiscal options to spend more, um, you know, two different ways of approaching it just to demonstrate that there are multiple um, uh, approaches that are on the table being discussed. Secondly, um, and this goes back to one of the earlier questions, we're, we provided some state board links. So first, a direct link to the agenda item, uh, number 13, that's LCFF. So folks can go back and actually look at you know, what, what's in the current regulations, the draft, what's in the LCAP, what's um, some of the broader framing around these different pieces that are coming before the board. And yes, the, the board will be webcast um, both days of the agenda, both the 6th and the 7th. Um, so that will be available. You can click on this link the day of and, and, and see it live. Um, the, the board also, um, and, and staff, they uh, will archive them a few days later, so they'll, uh, we provided that link for the archive web, webcast, and um, some of their previous meetings are obviously also on there. Um, and then finally, we wanted to leave you with just a few Children Now related um, URLs uh, where we have um, updated information around um, the, the law and um, all the different moving parts that are happening up and down the state. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Ted. Oh, well, great, Sam. Thank you very much, and thank you, Deborah, and thanks to all of you for uh, listening in. We uh, will continue to stay in, in close touch with you and, and look forward to uh, continuing announcements both about uh, these uh, state-level webinars but also some uh, information going out uh, directly to uh, community and, and, and parents and students. So uh, thank you all. It's going to take a lot of work from a lot, lots of people.
people to make sure that the law is implemented in a way that to make sure that uh, all the students in the state and the, the students that this law was most intended for uh, benefit. But uh, we're, we're uh, both uh, very excited by the, the possibility here and appreciate the, uh, all the hard work of folks at the state level and community level uh, to make this a reality. So thanks for your time and look forward to staying in close touch with